So we'll come on to this session of Alex and Sue Alumni Talks with uh, alumni of our recent fellows program sharing with us insights on their published and ongoing work. And so today we are we'll be very glad to have with us Jonathan Brunstedt and Otto Marco Kangasburo who, who will join in uh, with his comments after Jonathan's talk. So uh, Jonathan is an assistant professor of history at uh, the Texas A&M University. And he's a specialist in nationalism uh, and cultural memory, which studies union and more widely, and with a particular emphasis on the representation and commemoration of war. So we'll soon be happy to hear him talk uh, based on his recently published book, which is titled The Soviet Myth of World War Patriotic Memory and the Russian Question in the USSR, uh, which is based on archival work in several countries. And congratulations to Jonathan. Today is the day when uh, this book is being published in the US. Uh, it was previously published in. So, and Marco Kangaspuro, uh, he's a professor and director of the Alexandria Institute, uh, working both in political history and on the current day Russian developments uh, and on themes such as nationalism and identity politics and history politics. And he's also a frequent commentator on Russian affairs in the Finnish uh, media. So we'll soon give floor to Jonathan. Uh, and then after Marco Kangaspuro's comments, you can all join with your questions and comments uh, via chat or by raising your hand and then asking directly when uh, we'll have your uh, mic open and, and video as well, if you wish to. So Jonathan, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours for your speak, uh, speech titled Usable Past After Stalin, the Crisis of Patriotism and the Origins of the Soviet Cult of World War II. So please, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Anna. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, first, I'd like to thank Anna for inviting me and Marco for participating. Uh, I know it must be a busy time for you. Uh, and also for the, to the Alex and Terry Institute for, for hosting this. I had a, such a great experience there as a fellow a few years ago. Uh, I kind of fell in love with the, the Institute and Finland as a whole, and I, I'm look, looking for any excuse to go back. So, uh, well, I'm going to share a slide with my, well, I'll begin with a uh, vignette. In January of 1958, the Central Committee considered a proposal from the Stalingrad Regional Party Committee regarding the 15th anniversary of the victory at the Battle of Stalingrad. Among other things, the proposal called for establishing a, a grand monument to the, Stalingrad bat, uh, to the Stalingrad battle and the participation in the festivities of Khrushchev and other high-level political representatives. According to minutes of the meeting, the leadership approved most of the local commemorative measures, including the projected memorial complex, yet Khrushchev adamantly opposed the involvement of any Presidium members in the celebration. No one needs to go, Khrushchev remarked. Then, almost as a concession, he added, send Comrade Chuikov, who of course was the commander of the uh, 62nd Army during the Battle of Stalingrad. But just five years later, in 1963, Khrushchev not only found himself in the newly minted city of Volgograd, surveying the Stalingrad Memorial's construction site, but he was personally determining various elements of the design. And notably, it was Khrushchev who called for nearly doubling the height of the complex's uh, planned central monument so that, so that its grandiosity would surpass New York's Statue of Liberty. What explains Khrushchev's about face over the war's large-scale commemoration and the central party leadership uh, as connection to this, the war's commemoration. Indeed, the apparent reluctance among, among the Communist Party leadership to embrace the war victory as a central legitimating myth before the mid-1960s, that is before the 20th anniversary of victory in 1965, is often cited as a feature that distinguished the Khrushchev years from the Brezhnev era cult of World War II, which at its peak during the 1970s consisted of ubiquitous monuments, commemorative rituals, and mass media productions devised in part to legitimate an aging political elite. As Nina Tamarkin and others have observed, the theme of the war victory in central commemorations was rather muted between 1948 and 1965. The Supreme Soviet famously demoted Victory Day from a non-working to a working holiday in late 1947, Grand War Memorial projects within the USSR languished or were suspended, and the war as a theme was increasingly bound to Stalin's cult, 
all factors that precipitated the war theme's decline in popular culture. As charted by Denise Youngblood, filmmakers produced nine war films in 1946, five in 1949, and none by 1951. Following Stalin's death, the argument runs, the Khrushchev leadership remained unable or unwilling to fully embrace the war as a dominant myth of state given Stalin's central role in, in the war narrative, coupled with bureaucratic and financial constraints. This is not to mention various other processes tied to the war's representation, such as the cultural politics of the thaw and the steady return of political prisoners and wartime deportees. For Khrushchev in 1958, the participation of the top party brass in the commemoration at Stalingrad represented an unnecessarily auspicious gesture vis-a-vis -vis the war's memory at a time when so much remained in flux. Now, I should say that not all scholars agreed that the war's profile was quite so curtailed in the period before the 20th anniversary. Indeed, some propose a more linear trajectory. Emir Weiner, for example, has long argued that imbued as it was with eschatological significance, the war's public manifestations only intensified as the Soviet Union moved away from the October Revolution. More recent scholarship has considered regional and societal variation to explore the ways silence and war obsession operated at the same time. Within the military, the Komsomol, and among veterans and in certain localities, there was a relatively rich commemorative discourse that long predated the more centralized and grandiose war cult of the Brezhnev years. And here I could just mention uh, the recent work of Misha Gabovich, uh, who has argued, among other things, that in places like Ukraine, uh, Victory Day was celebrated uh, much earlier than 1965. But the question remains, what is going on here? Why was there a seeming reluctance among the central party leadership, especially in the immediate post-Stalin years, to elevate and centralize the war's memorialization before 1965? And how was this reluctance ultimately overcome? Today, I'll propose that in fact, the post stalin leadership unequivocally embraced the war as an important legitimating theme almost immediately after Stalin's death, but that this process was complicated by the dismantling of Stalin's cult of personality. Crucially, it wasn't just the place of Stalin as war leader the complicated things, but rather the challenge of decoupling the Russo-centrism of the Stalin era from the war's remembrance. One of Khrushchev's uh, major ideological projects, oh, and sorry, I, yeah, there's the Stalingrad Memorial there. One of Khrushchev's major ideological projects, after all, was the return to the Soviet present. That is the creation of a post-1917 usable past, dissociated from Russian and proto-Russian patriotic models from the pre-revolutionary era. And here I mean the kind of imagery uh, that Stalin invoked during his well-known Great Ancestor speech of November 1941 on Red Square, or shortly after the war on May 24th, 1945, when during the Kremlin banquet, Stalin delivered his famous toast to the Russian people, declaring that, quote, the trust of the Russian people in the Soviet government was the decisive force that ensured the historic victory over the enemy of mankind over fascism. No, for Khrushchev uh, uh, and, and the Khrushchev leadership, victory in the Great Patriotic War was to be the crowning achievement of a teleology that began in 1917 and decidedly not the culmination of a thousand-year Russian triumphalist through line. It was in no small part the challenges presented by disentangling the war from the Russian historical experience that prevented the war cult's emergence before the 1960s. Okay. So the ultimate decision to embrace the war unfolded in several phases, and I'll just outline them here briefly. You have this period 1953 to 1960, where Stalin's death and denunciation witnessed the beginning of the dismantling of the Stalin cult. But Stalin's war record was left largely untouched, meaning his status as war leader and his Russo-centric casting of victory remained ambiguous. Then you have 1961 to 62, when destalinization intensifies. Here we see a more intense wave of desalinization that directly targeted Stalin's war record and Russo-centric war narratives. And this was mainly the result of the 22nd Party Congress and the introduction of a new uh, uh, party program. From 1963, you get an official embrace of the war, large-scale, all-union commemoration of the war victory that was embraced uh, and elevated as a dominant post-revolutionary myth of state. Now, importantly, this post-1961 victory myth was broadly inclusive or pan-Soviet, 
and generally unmoored from pre-revolutionary historical precedent, although the leadership continued to face some resistance to this pan-Soviet orientation until the end of the decade. Now, I won't have time to go into extensive detail here, so if there's anything I, I seem to gloss over, uh, feel free to bring it up uh, during the Q&A. <clears throat> All right, so this first period, 1953-1960, what do I mean by an ambiguous, uh, an ambiguous official stance on Stalin's and Stalin the Generalissimo? We now know that there was very little hesitation on the part of the leadership to embrace the theme of the war of victory, of course, sanitized of Stalin's presence as a core legitimating myth of state after Stalin's death. By the time of the 20th Congress and the secret speech, the Central Committee was already overseeing plans for a network of war memorial complexes and formulating a special commission to explore the question of the war's immortalization across the USSR. But whereas Stalin-era authorities often looked to anchor the war's remembrance in a distinctly Russian historical framework, that is, in the imagery of Alexander Nevsky, Suvorov, and Kutuzov, the victory myth that would coalesce in the years after Stalin's death uh, recast 1945 along exclusively pan-Soviet and post-revolutionary lines. Indeed, authorities conceived of, of those aforementioned measures on the war's immortalization as contributing to the development of a post-revolutionary history more generally, rendering such primordial illusions all but obsolete. But the Khrushchev-era program to create a distinctly Soviet historical mythology saw setbacks almost immediately and was heavily contested. The 20th Congress line quickly gave way to a more ambiguous official stance on Stalin's war record, complicating early official efforts to develop this post-Stalinist history of the war more generally. In part, this was connected to the cultural thaw, which made it difficult to promote the war as an unambiguously heroic myth. But the ambiguous official line on Stalin's war record was also perhaps overwhelmingly linked to the vagaries of the 20th Congress line itself especially as it evolved over the course of 1956. Popular reactions to the secret speech typically honed in on Khrushchev's criticism of Stalin's wartime leadership. Even among respondents uh, uh, who wrote to the Central Committee and agreed with the speech's general critique of Stalin, Stalin's war leadership often remained beyond reproach. It was seen as kind of almost a redeeming virtue uh, of Stalin's. Thus, to preserve the war myth as a source of party authority, some in the leadership argued that a degree of moderation over Stalin's image was necessary, especially his role in the war. So a uh, subsequent uh, uh, Central Committee resolution of June 1956 uh, basically superseded the, the secret speech, uh, and it did just this. In the process of editing this resolution for publication, we see the Central Committee uh, effectively remove Stalin from the equation and emphasize that to, to quote one of these late, late last minute editions, it was precisely during the war that the members of the Central Committee and military most forcefully asserted themselves against Stalin's incorrect actions. The resolution's particular vagueness on the issue of, of the war effectively left that sensitive aspect of the Stalinist past open to interpretation. Such ambiguity with regard to the specific nature of Stalin's war leadership remained essentially unchanged until 1961, when Khrushchev relaunches his campaign against the personality cult. So this ambiguous line produced an inconsistent official war narrative and assured that elements of Stalinist Russocentrism would remain intact. And it was actually highly contested in, in, in meetings about how to betray the war and things like this. We can talk about this later, but I'll just give a, a couple of brief examples. In 1957, a commission was put together to create a, a new six-volume official history of the war, uh, which would replace the Stalinist text on the Great Patriotic War, which was the most authoritative text uh, on the war up to that point. The issue of Russocentrism and historical heroism was not discussed within the commission until after 1961, so that in the text of the first volumes published during this period of ambiguity, one can read diverging assessments of the role of Stalin's appeal to, the, to Russian leadership and Russia's historical precedents. For example, volume two, which covered 1941, uh, quoted uh, uh, key Russo-centric markers from 1941, such as uh, Stalin's great ancestor speech, noting the subsequent campaign to promote the glorious uh, pages of the history of the Russian people. However, 
The editors, led in this case by N.A. Fulkin, affixed additional commentary assuring that an alternative socialist message was always conveyed every time there was one of these Brusselcentric statements. So the text immediately following Stalin's great ancestor speech reads as following. In drawing historical parallels, Stalin emphasized with all his might that the enemy was now dealing with the Soviet people and the new socialist Russia, whose strength has increased tenfold since the Great October Revolution. The main thrust of journalism involved articles and essays that educated the Soviet people in the spirit of devotion to the socialist fatherland, urging perseverance and fearlessness. The idea of defending the Soviet motherland became the main theme of all wartime literature. Throughout the first volumes, by contextualizing historical Russo-centric appeals with adjoining passages emphasizing the revolutionary and often super-ethnic nature of victory, the history, at least these first volumes, in effect, presented two contending victory narratives alongside one another, which did very little to resolve the ambiguities. The lead editors of the project, Pyotr Pospolov and Yevgeny Bolton, later cited conditions set forth in the June Resolution as the main reason that Stalin's Russo-centric statements permeated the first three volumes. Of course, it wasn't just histories. We see the ambiguity in physical markers from the Stalin era as well, which I'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A. But you really see clashes over, do we remove this Russo-centric inscription or do we keep it? And there was a great deal of ambiguity here overall. Okay, so what changes? From 1961 to 1962, de-Stalinization intensifies and expands to include Stalin's war record and its symbols, especially after the 22nd Party Congress in late 1961. This is, of course, where you get the changing of the name Stalingrad to Volgograd. It was only after this 22nd Congress. By ending the official ambiguity over Stalin's wartime role as expressed in the June Resolution, it became possible to critique Stalin's appeals to Russian leadership of historical greatness. But something else is going on here. During his speech during the 22nd Congress, Khrushchev offered a rather striking description of a Soviet people bound by shared post-revolutionary qualities. Famously, he states, in the USSR, there has emerged a new historical community of people of different nationalities who share common characteristics, etc., etc. The introduction of the so-called Soviet people doctrine has long been the subject of scholarly debate. Many have seen it as a smokescreen for Russian domination of other Soviet peoples. On the other end of the debate, some have argued that this project was a serious effort at assimilation and an attempt to move away from distinct ethno-national identities in favor of a homogenous Soviet people. And I would say most recently, Senator Akhturk, in a really great book, has argued somewhat provocatively that Soviet narod should perhaps be better rendered in English as Soviet nation. And this is probably the most extreme version of this, but it was a recent book, and it's a really, really good book. So, yeah, so, in fact, what I argue is the campaign carried out under Khrushchev and more fully under Brezhnev to promote the Soviet people as a so-called new historical community was never precisely an effort to bring about assimilation. Although late socialist leaders sometimes referenced the eventual fusion or slyanya of peoples, this remained a wholly abstract concept unimaginable before the establishment of communism around the world. So what is happening here? Well, rather than a purely assimilationist project, the Soviet people doctrine is better understood as an attempt to reconcile the contrasting Russo-centric and pan-Soviet mobilizational discourses that had been unleashed by the dismantling of Stalin's cult. It was to overcome these ambiguities that had emerged in the aftermath of 1956. So the development of the doctrine leading up to its 1961 introduction specifically bound ideas of Russian leadership of an ethnically diverse community of peoples to the narrative spheres of pre-revolutionary and early Soviet modernization, while carefully confining the theme of the World War II victory to the opposite pan-Soviet end of a mobilizational spectrum. And I made this sort of schematic here, which I did yesterday, and it took me like two hours, but it's just to visualize these points I'm making here. Now, if this seems too neat, I point out that the Soviet people doctrine as a means of managing what were contrasting hierarchical and lateral expressions of Soviet patriotic identity 
stem directly from conclusions drawn by an important party commission on preparations for the 22nd Congress and the new party program, which were hammered out between 1958 and 1961 when it was introduced. The commission involved hundreds of ideological workers divided into dozens of working groups, the solicitation of public comments, and the direct involvement of high-ranking party officials like Khrushchev, Suslov, Kostolov, and many others. So the work of this commission offers the clearest picture of the nature and function of the Soviet people's doctrine. The results of the commission show that the rhetorical balance struck between assimilation and national flourishing, and the role of the war's memory in promoting the assimilationist end of this spectrum constituted an agreed-upon framework for the expression of Soviet patriotism. The documentation surrounding the commission's work is actually really fascinating, and I won't have time to go into great deal here, but briefly, the commission determined that while the leading role of the Russian people was an appropriate theme when it came to early Soviet modernization narratives, the war victory was to promote the idea of a laterally arrayed Soviet people. So, for example, Z.I. Muratov, a high-ranking Tatar in the Central Committee, for example, proposed to the commission a fuller acknowledgement of the Russian people's status as first among equals, which for Muratov included their leading role in the World War II victory. The commission rejected this, permitting instead a single reference to the great Russian people in the context of industrial development, while identifying the war as a feat of the whole Soviet people, regardless of ethno-national affiliation. And I could give countless examples where the response was just like this. But the commission was equally unyielding over proposals to eliminate fundamental markers of sub-state ethnic identity in favor of an overarching Soviet category. One quite typical suggestion submitted to the commission was to state in the party program that the rapprochement of peoples will inevitably lead to the formation of a single Soviet nation, or Nazia. The commission's blanket justification for rejecting such proposals held that, as Lenin teaches, such a process will occur only after the victory of communism on a global scale. Throughout the program's various drafts, this commission at once upheld the principle of institutionalized multi-ethnicity in specific contexts, namely pre-revolutionary ethnic relations and early Soviet modernization, while favoring super-ethnic uniformity as the overriding message of the World War II victory. And I'd be happy to go into the reasons for this during Q&A, but the important point is that this commission, and by extension the party leadership, crafted a patriotic framework which balanced, through the Soviet people doctrine, hierarchical and lateral, Russo-centric and pan-Soviet mobilizational models. And the war victory was fixed squarely to the pan-Soviet pole of this mobilizational spectrum. So, following the 22nd Congress in 1961, we see this new doctrine reflected almost immediately in the war's public representation. Where we previously saw ambiguity over the place of the Russian people and their historical providence in depictions of wartime patriotism, we now see a decisive rejection of Russo-centric war narratives. Here I'll just highlight the completion of the six-volume official history of the war. Now, the last two volumes, five and six, were completed after the introduction of the Soviet people doctrine and hence reflected the war's decidedly pan-Soviet orientation. Last-minute edits were made to the fifth volume, which was almost finished before the 22nd Congress, and then they – so they rushed to make these last-minute changes after the Congress. So they, these last-minute changes were made to incorporate this new 22nd Congress line. What did these changes entail? Well, just before the commission submitted the manuscript to the printer in July 1962, one of its members made the final edits by hand, striking through, among other things, the entirety of Stalin's toast to the Russian people and substituting in its place the following, the following alternative. Uh, just a quote from this uh, uh, insert right here. The great victory of German imperialism is due to the patriotic efforts of the peoples of the Soviet country, the sons of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Moldova, workers of all nations and nationalities united in fraternal union under the invincible banner of Lenin. This specifically replaces Stalin's toast to the Russian people. Likewise, the Commission's approach to the sixth and final volume of the series 
which was devoted to explaining the war's overall significance and the factors that led to victory, embodied this new pan-Soviet orientation of the Soviet people doctrine from the ground up. I'll give just some excerpts from the drafting commission as they discuss the various, point, the various points about the sources of victory in the war. All right, as the writing of volume six uh, was getting underway, a researcher by the name of Prokofiev detailed what he saw to be one of the fundamental challenges of the final volume. For him, it was eliminating the idea of Russian superiority. The commission assigned M.G. Uh, Zhirovkov to specifically address this matter in the volume's chapter on ideology. Zhirovkov and his team looked to condemn manifestations of Russocentrism as both features of the Stalin cult and fodder for Western historians seeking to distort the nature of Soviet patriotism. Zhirovkov pointed in particular to the introduction of officer and general ranks, epaulets in the Red Army, the appeal to the courageous images of our, great, of our people's great ancestors, Minin, Pajarsky, Nevsky, Suvorov, and Kutuzov. According to Zhirovkov, Western commentators exploited such wartime measures by suggesting that they were, quote, an attempt to reinforce socialist ideology with the revival of the vanished greatness of old Russia. Along these lines, Zhirovkov went so far as to de describe the serious damage to the understanding of the character of the Great Patriotic War caused by Stalin's appeal to the great ancestors. So this brings me to the final phase, the full embrace of the war victory as an all-union myth of state from 1963. And here I'll, I'll just I'll give a rather brief overview. Put simply, in the wake of the 22nd Congress, an introduction of the Soviet people doctrine, open contestations over the nature of Soviet patriotism became more frequent, certainly for many sympathetic to what they perceived to be the resurrection of Russian national patriotic culture under Stalin, the pan-Soviet orientation of, of the war's uh, new framing provided an insufficient basis for patriotic identity. Uh, I'll just give an ex one example here. This view was sort of typified after the 22nd Congress by the artist Ilya Glazunov. During a, a December 1962 session with the Ideological Commission, Glazunov was outspoken over the need to root Soviet patriotism in the Russian national past. He cited, quote, the miserable state of propaganda and educational organs dedicated to promoting patriotic pride in the past and present. He claimed a complete lack of propaganda about our Russian national traditions. I want to say that, this is Glazunov, uh, Glazunov speaking, I want to say that the patriotic picture is very sad, especially in the, in the field of the military past. Amid these growing tensions, the Ideological Commission, citing the 22nd Congress, recommended the expansion of civic or socialist rituals and holidays. But whereas the earlier introduction of such practices failed to appeal to people's emotions, and this, by the way, caused a panic because there was apparently a revival of religion among, uh, uh, among Russian youths, uh, and, and the, the, the conclusion was that religion appeals to people's emotions, but our socialist traditions do not uh, have that same appeal. So this new wave of uh, civic rituals needed to emphasize this emotional factor. And here's where they decide that the war is really key here. Uh, Khrushchev actually visited the, uh, 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 the Trep Tower uh, Park Memorial, and he gave a, a speech when he came back to the Soviet Union saying that, wow, I saw people crying out there. And so you have this real uh, uh, a dramatic turn to the war. Uh, during this period. And this is kind of what I've described as this crisis of patriotic identity and the, the solutions offered. So by the end of 1963, it was pre-existing military patriotic rituals within the Komsomol uh, uh, that had joined these new style of marriage and birth registrations among other life events in the pantheon of civic rituals. It was the union-wide expansion of pre-existing military patriotic commemorations, as well as their decidedly pan-Soviet orientation that distinguished the so-called cult of the war from earlier instances of the war's remembrance. Now, in lieu of a conclusion, I'll just say that rather than the 20th anniversary of victory in 1965, the ideological chief uh, Leonid Ilyichov's address during the June 1963 party plenum might better be seen as the war cult's true unveiling. Ilyichov 
spoke to the various calls by 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 Russian Rusnophiles and and sort of Russian national nationalist oriented intellectuals like Glazunov for greater attention to the Russian past. Uh, uh, Ilichov specifically condemned those as remnants of a nationalistic, chauvinistic ideology. He called them the idealization of the past and national swagger, all of which obscured the new shared socialist traditions common to all Soviet nations who were on course to achieve complete unity. It was in the context of such unity that Ilichov invoked the war's memory. Uh, and this is quoting Ilichov here. For the Soviet people, internationalism is not an abstract concept. Shoulder to shoulder, Soviet peoples of different nationalities constructed socialism and shed blood in the fight against fascism. But, Ilichov pointed out, nearly the entire burden of preserving the war's patriotic memory fell on the shoulders of youth organizations. There was, quote, no justification for the wider public's continued indifference and inattention to the memory of the heroes of the war. It was now time, Ilichov proclaimed, to establish the glorious tradition of a nationwide celebration of heroes who fell in the struggle for the freedom and honor of our motherland. This was one of the few sections of a rather dry address that, according to the stenographic record, elicited both stormy and prolonged applause. Uh, so thank you. I'll just, if you, there's more stuff, stuff here. This book just came out today in the United States. So.